Today, I'm interviewing Stephen Marsh. He's an award-winning novelist who's written fiction and regular columns for publications like Esquire, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Uh, he was professor uh, at the City College of New York and hosts the popular uh, Audible podcast, How Not to Fuck Up Your Kids Too Bad, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, he's been working with AI since 2017. Uh, but Stephen was made famous and made waves by writing his first AI-assisted novella, Death of an Author, uh, sparking virtual conversations about hey, how AI and humanity and human creativity uh, can uh, collaborate productively. As a pioneer leveraging AI as a collaborative storytelling tool, he offers experience-based wisdom from the frontiers of creative innovation and how to responsibly utilize technology to expand human potential in business and the arts. Today, we'll learn to use AI as a tool to augment imagination that can take your human ingenuity to new levels. So welcome, Stephen. Hi, nice to be with you. Yeah, um, you know, let's just dive right in. How did you get involved with AI? When did you first find it? You know, what happened and what did you think? Well, it's actually kind of funny because back in 2012, when the digital humanities were starting to take over universities, I wrote a piece that was against digital humanities. And it was about, it was a critique of the whole digital hum humanities movement because I found it not very useful. Like I thought like people were like, can we, can we double click on digital humanities and just unpack that for a second? Well, digital humanities is what was a way of using technology to read texts. Um, a lot of it was, with, you know, primitively with R, but I mean, there were some very interesting usages of it. Uh, you know, the probably the most important was Distant Reading by Franco Moretti, which was, um, I mean, I just thought it was kind of a, a fraud because it used tech to make really obvious points like that, you know, narrative works in six different ways and they could graph this in various ways, but really mm -hmm. it was kind of like just using text to, tech as a cover for, uh, you know, really obvious insights. And that was my point when I wrote this piece in 2012. And because of that piece, um, I got a lot of criticism. I got a lot of pieces encouraging me, but I also got a lot of pretty genuine scholars saying like, look, you know, I see your point of view, but why don't you have a look at this and, and look at this? And that's, how, so I sort of got um, insider's view at some of the most, and, I, and and then I was like, well, that's real. Like there's some stuff here that's actually real and really important and not part of some, you know, tech hype machine. Um, and, and so that, and then obviously I also live in Toronto and I happen to live in a neighborhood where a lot of the people who invented the transformer and AI happened to live and they were hanging around the dog park and I just happened to meet them. Right. So it was like, it, like it, it, it was a, it was a pretty interesting series of coincidences for me, but then, you know, so I was already using it in 2017 to write mm -hmm. fiction. Like I, I thought that there was generative potential in it in, in 2017. And then obviously as generative AI took off, I was sort of using each new tool as it came about to see what it could do in a, in a sort of experimental way. And, you know, no one was interested in that stuff until about a year ago. How did you get into using it for fiction writing? Well, I saw it as, a, you know, the way that I saw um, the artificial linguistic artificial intelligence or natural language processing really generally was as an analytic tool, right? Like that's how it was being used in 2015, 2016 um, by, by digital humanists. And I was like, well, that's interesting, but can it actually be applied? Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like if you're if you're if you're capable of using AI as a critical tool, um, can it be used generatively? Because, you know, as a writer, like you read and study and learn how things work, how how fiction works, and then you apply it. And I was like, well, can we kind of not necessarily automate that process, but can we can we enhance it technologically? And the experiments were pretty were pretty interesting. I mean, it, it's actually kind of fascinating now because like the generative potential of AI has completely taken over the discourse. Um, but, you know, it, eventually it will be it, like its analytic functions are actually pr probably more powerful than its generative ones. They just haven't been um, applied properly um, and they or they just have they, they have not garnered the attention of, of chat GPT and, um, and and other and other AIs. But yeah, so like to me, it was like this is sort of naturally flowing from the creative process generally, if you will, like rather than rather than necessarily like any tech innovation. I was like, well, let's see if we can if we can use this. And then Wired mm -hmm. was up for it. So I wrote, you know, I wrote a short story for Wired using 
um, a computer scientist at University of Toronto and and a digital humanist at University of Toronto. We collaborated to create our own sort of experiment. Mm -hmm. When you think about generative intelligence, I mean, to me, it comes down to how you hold it and how you relate to it in your own mind. What do you what is this? How do you explain it? How do you describe it? How do you represent it to yourself? Well, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things about using AI from an early point, like from 2017 on, is that I've seen it develop, right? So I've seen it mm -hmm. become different tools. And that to mm -hmm. me is really all that they are, right? They're just, they're just different tools um, with different potentials and different um, applications. And each of those tools has a sort of different um, artistic practice that can emerge from it. But it, mm -hmm. it is, it's really a question of figuring out what that is. And I mean, you know, I think you have to remember that similar leaps, creative leaps technologically, uh, took a long time for people to figure out what they were like the film uh, like the camera was not really considered an appropriate tool for art for almost you know almost 80 years after its invention mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. similarly like the film camera like you know people understood that they could capture motion but the idea of like a sequence of mo of, of motions being turned into a narrative um you know that took almost 30 years to get to and I think we're in a very similar place with artificial intelligence. We don't quite know what it's going to turn into. We don't know what quite what genre or art. I mean, it's not even a genre. I think it's a different, it's a distinct art form, um, what it's going to turn into. And it's, um, you know, I've been doing experiments, but I don't, I, don't, I think we're, we're still, uh, we're still a long way from figuring out what that is. What are the creative tasks or the kind of elements that you feel that, AI is really good at versus the ones that, you know, you kind of need a human for? Well, I, I mean, in all of my dealings with artificial intelligence of any kind, um, Morovich's paradox has been absolute. You know, Morovich's paradox is that the more um, complex a task, the easier for AI to do. The more simple a task, the harder for AI to do. So if you want to have an artificial intelligence do what James Joyce did in Ulysses, like imitate a bunch of systems and create a world conjuring. It, it can very easily do that. Telling it to generate a, an interesting plot. I've never encountered an artificial intelligence that can do that in, a, in an effective way, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I've used a, a whole bunch of them, right? So, and that was true even, that was true in 2017. The numerical statistical pattern matching machine for plot is very vague. And, and and quite and quite unknowable. Whereas elaborations of style, like the most elaborate styles, um, that's what it's incredibly good at, right? So it like it can it can do it can do the most complex things uh, creatively very easily. Um, what it can't do is the most simple things. Um, and so when we talk about like finding a path for creative artificial intelligence, like finding a way to get it to where. Um, where it's useful and where it's going to provoke new things. I think it's in refinements of those, very rapid refinements of those ultra complicated uh, artistic projects, but not the simple things. I don't think I don't think artificial intelligence is gonna be particularly useful in finding out what a good story is. I, I, I have not seen it anyway. Hey, quick question for you. What are you learning from this interview? And what do you wanna learn next? Well, you probably want to stay ahead of the curve with AI just like we want to, and we want to be your top resource for interesting, cutting-edge AI tools and knowledge here on MetaMind. We're finding and interviewing interesting experts from different worlds, different industries, and then we're using this knowledge so we can keep up with AI and improve our success, improve our quality of life. So stay with us on this journey. So first, click on the subscribe button, which you'll find under the video so that YouTube puts this into your feed when we release new interviews with AI experts. And if you're enjoying this interview, please give me a like to let others know that this is the real deal. And also, if you know someone who's interested in what we're talking about here, then send this interview to them so that they can learn with you. And I also wanna hear from you. So go down to the comments below and let me know what's your favorite prompt or prompting technique. What are your favorite AI resources or tools? What are you learning from this conversation? Do you disagree with anything we're saying here? And also, what else would you like to learn? Who would you like me to interview here on MetaMind? 
All right, well, go and subscribe, leave me a comment below, and back to our interview. Hmm. You don't think that it's gonna reach a point where it's going to be able to abstract out these interesting kind of elements and then remix them into something that a human is gonna say, wow, that is innovative, at that level. Oh, no, I mean, I think it's fully capable of, you know, it's a tool. So it does what mm -hmm. a, a human tells it to do. Mm -hmm. um, and what, and what, like, it has no will, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it, what it is important to understand is that the combination and recombination of things um, is absolutely a, a, a form of originality. It's just distinct, it's just distinct from the original impulse of like having a story or wanting an image to exist. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, I think, you know, the model for me is really hip hop. Like, I think hip hop is actually the, the closest analog creatively to what um, this is. You're you're essentially mixing and matching and finding commonalities and finding a rhythm for a series of patterns, a series mm -hmm. of linguistic patterns and a series of linguistic styles. And when you recombine them in an interesting way, you get really high quality work like that's what i did in, in death of an author right um but getting to the point where like the original story like if you tell it right give me a plot for a detective fiction i mean it's just very bad at that it's just mm -hmm. it's not that it can't do it it's just that you know you wouldn't actually want it to do that and you know we're, i i don't see a point in you know there's no point having a machine generate lousy stories because there's already yeah. so many of them Right. You yeah. don't need to automate being bad at writing like that's already the human beings are taking care of that. Yeah. When I use it for uh, writing, I'm, I'm totally with you, by the way. Really, really great points. Um, when I use it for writing and I'm going to kind of analogize, I would imagine that if I was going to be writing a plot, that if I gave it a, a high quality prompt, a thoughtful prompt, and I had it generate a plot and then I had it generate like maybe 50 plots maybe within them, I would find a few pieces and I'd say, you know what, that's a good little chunk. That's a good little chunk. And I might be able to take some elements and weave them together, but it's not going to be able to do the whole thing, but it might create some really innovative little insights. Is that kind of... Well, it? I mean, you know, it's it, it's definitely, you can use it for that sort of thing. But I think when you're up to like, gen, you know, the way I, you know, and obviously this could change. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they could like, I mean, God knows I could go on Gemini today and discover that's tremendous at this stuff, but yeah. you, you never yeah. know what this stuff is going to cough up. I mean, it's right. like, right. it's really, you don't know what's, what it's good at and what it's bad at. I mean, it's very, very odd, but like if you're generating 50 things and then taking a bunch of ideas from them, you're a, why even like, it's better to just go for a walk and think it out for yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, and, and obviously you're also, being things that you recognize and taking them into yourself. Now, that's true of the entire creative process when you're using AI, that you're always yeah. filtering it. With, like there, the idea that this is going to replace creators, um, it, it, the, the reason that it's so obviously not true to people who use it a lot is that you, you're going to need someone to recognize what's good, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to need someone who's going to be able to put those things in some kind of order. So, um, I mean, I, I just, I just never found it really good at generating and, and the ideas it tends to generate, particularly through the more advanced models like chat GPT or chat GPT now, especially, I mean, it just generates the most banal answers conceivable, right? Like that's the, that's what it, it's a banality machine, right? Like it produces the standard response. I mean, what uh -huh. it's unbelievably good at is if you need to write a letter of recommendation for somebody, you just put their name and the features in and it will write it in the, like way better than you could. Right. Yeah. Or if you wanted to write yeah, yeah, yeah. a threatening letter from a lawyer, like there's like it's it's going to it's going to write a, 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 a lawyer's threatening letter pretty much as well as a threatening lawyer. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's those kind of things that it seems to me like it's highly efficient. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you could, I guess, go through and generate plots and then, you know, make 100 points and take three of them and incorporate it into your thing. But, you know, why would you do that? It's a, that's not that's not an efficient use of of the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is your process of collaborating with AI? Like, how do you do it? Well, it depends on what I was writing and the state of the tech. Right. So mm -hmm. like I wrote a story in 2020 that was 17 percent computer generated. That's when no one had ever published anything 
like the idea that something could be computer generated and people just did literally just did not understand what you meant when you told them that um mm -hmm. and then i would just put in blocks of text and then have gpt3 complete them right and 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 that was that was a very kind of crude system um i was working with a large language model company here in toronto called cohere um which is a bunch of really brilliant guys who are you know they run this large language model company but they're also like the cocios in a band and they're very creative very uh, exciting awesome. guys and yeah they're 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 kind of really really interesting people and we built a um like they allowed me to train the model on specific authors and then i would give it a i, I would give it a prompt that was the, I, I, after like training it on the collected works of dickens i would have it write a single sentence from the point of dickens and i did this with i mean maybe two dozen authors and wrote a sort of generalized love story auto mm -hmm. i called it auto tune love story again nobody ever saw that it was published in lit hub and then with death of an author you know that was when it would so that's like a you know twenty five thousand words that's like a much more significant task than um anything else i'd attempted with ai i used chat gpt um to gen with hugely blocked uh prompts like syntax and grammar prompts sentence variability prompts what does hugely blocked mean it means like um what I mean is like, I'm, I just, I, that's not a technical term of any kind. It's just <laughs> okay. like, w like very specific on the syntax and grammar structures that you're asking okay. for. I mean, uh -huh. as you know, from your own work with prompts, like the more specific you are, the better. Yes. Right. And yes. like, the, and, and the more, and the more you like co coherently prompt it, you know, in a series of ways, the better a response you're going to get. Then I would take that. I put it into pseudo, right which is a stochastic writing instrument that allows you to um, basically take a block of text and the machine will shorten it or lengthen it, or, you know, you can put it in the style of, it has a customized button. So it's like put in the style of, you know, Ernest Hemingway or what, or, or whoever, and it will do that. Um, and then I also use Cohere for individual lines. So that they allowed me not just to prompt engineer, but to train the prompts so I would create the prompts and then I would train it on a, on a series of examples. So, you know, and I think when you get into the space where you're not just prompt engineering, you're building the archives that the prompt re reflect, reflects on, that's, a, that's another layer of creativity that gives you a lot more control and gives you a lot more, you're building something much more specific when you build it that way. And so that's, uh, you know, and so that was for, I did that for individual lines in the novel because obviously it's so labor intensive to make, you know, a, a basically mm -hmm. a machine for a sentence um, that you, you I, I couldn't really do it more than, I think I did it 12 times, but th mm -hmm. those were the best lines in the book for sure. So. It, it, oh, interesting. So you made the best stuff in the book with this process. Yeah, but it's too, like, and we also have like, we've generated, no one will publish it, but Cohere and I have, have generated an infinite short story. So that's like, it's the same story told. It's the same story just told differently every time because it's built out of prompts with archives, right? So it's like, so you're essentially creating, you know, when when you get the artistry of the archive, that's when you're, that's the actual work of creative AI. But, you know, the truth is that every prog, every, every program you do, like every project that you undertake in this space, you're eventually having to create an entirely new artistic practice. And those artistic practices are also aren't super replicable. Like they don't, like I'm never going to do another novel with ChatGPT3 and Cohere and pseudo, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't know why anyone else would either. Like I, I, I've just done that in a very specific kind of practice. So like, the, and, and, you know, all the projects that I'm working on now are also very specific in their practice. Um, and I, I think I'm getting closer to things that only AI can do and that contain much more of the artificial, of the power of artificial intelligence and its alterity, its alienness. Um, but I, I mean, we'll have to see how that work comes out. Okay. So you said something here about um, something in the effect of once you generate the archive, that that's the creative work of the AI. Well, I think people like prompt engineering, we understand, right? And like, so I, I'm doing that. I mean, I'm pr I'm designing prompts for these things. Mm -hmm. But if you can create a prompt and then you can train that prompt on examples, 
li mm -hmm. linguistic examples. Um, wh wh I mean, I'm using the term archive loosely as probably 15 sentences, right, is the whole archive. Um, then you're controlling two aspects of the creative process, and then you get things that are much more specific and much less like what chat GPT throws up. Also, you know, I have the luxury, I mean, I think I'm one of the very, very only artists who has access to, you know, m manipulable um, artificial intelligence, right? That I can, because I have friends who are engineers who can do this. And that mm -hmm. creates just a, a whole other layer of, of creativity. Yeah, so just so that I can, I think I'm getting you now, um, because we, one of my startups, we build tools and chains and kind of, you know, systems of prompts. And so it's one thing to actually design a prompt and then to prompt with it and then to see the results and then to change the prompt a little bit and then to see how the results are and then change the prompt. Then it is to make several prompts and then look at the results and then change all of them and then look at the results and compare the different sets of prompts to each other. Yeah. Well, if you're building a prompt for whatever you're doing, you're building it into mid journey or you're building it into whatever, right? Like yeah. whatever your, whatever artificial intelligence company you're working with, right? It, if you're allowed to build the archive that trains the prompt, you are essentially altering what mid journey is. You're building your own small, tiny little flake of your own mid journey every single time. Got it. Right. Okay. So yeah, like, no, like, and that means that like the, like that's where the, the ultimate creativity is going to come from this. I don't think visual artists really understand it yet because they don't, they don't have access to this thing, but like, if you wait, what mid journey is and what these companies are, are styles. Right. But if you it, it built from the archives that they built them from, but if you mm -hmm. can create your own archive and apply the artificial intelligence to your own, that, that you're creating your own sensibility that you are then that the artificial intelligence is then reflective of. And that's a, that, I mean, as I said, that's unbelievably expensive in, mm -hmm. in terms of time. And, and the, I mean, Cohere was doing it because we did it for the New York times and, you know, but it was, it, it's a fortune. Right. Like mm -hmm. to, to, to build these things like, and for, you know, for the result being a short story that no one reads. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, like, um, you, you know, so, but that to me is like the actual, um, that's sort of the creativity behind the creativity. And, and, and that's also going to be where I think, um, the most exciting material is going to come from because that's how, that's the way they're going to build an artificial lawyer. And, and, and an artificial doctor is by mm -hmm. shaping the, those responses to the archive. And then obviously with a human re, you know, loop feedback, but essentially what I'm doing is becoming my own human feedback loop for the artificial intelligence that I'm training, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that makes it more distinct, right? It makes it like, you're essentially reading the artificial intelligence of Stephen Marsh when you, mm -hmm. when you do it. And that's a, that's a, that's a very different thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're making your, you're making an artificial self in a sense. Yeah. And you feel like, like I always feel when I'm dealing with other systems that I'm dealing with essentially somebody else's reaction to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. When you do it yourself, you get that little feeling that you're actually touching it yourself. And mm -hmm. that's a very powerful feeling. And I, I mean, if I were to say, what is the future of this art? It is, getting other people, not just the artists, to experience that weird feeling like you're actually touching something alien, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that requires a kind of different, a different modality or, you know, a series of modalities because it's like, I, this is just the way that I'm doing it. But, um, you know, how, like I, I'm sure smar smarter artists are going to come along and figure out better technical solutions. I know they mm -hmm. are. Mm-hmm. So I interact with a lot of artists. Um, we collect art. I'm an artist myself. A lot of artists are very afraid of this, as you've seen. There's a huge amount of, you know, a lot of pain going on right now, a lot of fear and so forth. When you talk to artists and you talk to creatives, because you're, you're a little bit further down the road, what do you say to them? And how do you, uh, I mean, number one, what do you say? Number two, how do you teach them to adapt and use these tools? Well, they... I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been out here on my own a long time, 
You know what I mean? Like I've been doing this since 2017 when, when like, you know, pitching people an artificial intelligence story, they're like, why are you talking to me about science fiction? Like I, you know, artists have responded, particularly the other thing is I come from the literary world, which is incredibly conservative, much more conservative than visual arts. And their reaction to this work is loathing, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the reaction of writers to this work is to try and sue, um, you know, open AI. Right. Um, I don't like no one will listen to me at all. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and, you know, it. It, like, you know, that infinite short story, like I'm probably going to have to do a, a visual art installation of some kind because this no one in the literary world will publish it. Even the people who publish my earlier stuff. Right. Like um, and there's also things like, you know, death of an author, which, you know, is strictly the product of me. No one else in the world could have made it. It is. It bells absolutely my imprimatur as an artist. I don't own copyright to it, right? Like the legal, like the legal framework of this does not exist yet. So, yeah, the artists are, are you know, just like with the camera. Like the the artists when when the camera came along were absolutely terrified of it, and they thought it was the end of art. I mean, Baudelaire said it was the end of end of art as we know it. Um, and of course, it's it's mm -hmm. not that. It, I think when you use it, you start to realize like okay, this isn't really going to hurt anyone. This is actually like a, a quite an interesting toy and quite an interesting process. And it is an amazing tool in many ways. But like, if your writing can be replaced by ChatGPT, you shouldn't be writing. Like, it's not like it's a, um, it, it's not a, it's not a useful tool. If you're trying to create original, beautiful work, it has to be manipulated in very specific ways that require artistry to get to get things out of it. So, I mean, I think on the one hand, where I'm at now is that um, loathing is natural, right? Fear and loathing are natural. When you, you've got a machine here that does creativity, it's, it's a category violation, right? Like it's not, like machines are not supposed to be able to do this. Um, we're not supposed to be, have these machines help us. Um, and, you know, eventually it'll just, it'll take its rightful place and and then no one will ever say they were against it right um but there's like th there's nothing there's nothing really we can do the the loathing of ai i mean it's also you know ai also has the misfortune to come to appear after 10 years of the tech world basically destroying the world right and 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 like creating a situation where no one would no why would anyone trust um you know, a, a technology company to regulate itself or to be even basically decent, um, like in 2023. I mean, burn me 10,000 times, shame on me. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're at the end where Facebook has just, you know, annihilated its own democracy for the sake of improved engagement metrics. I mean, it's not like a distrust of tech is, is also perfectly natural. Um, I just don't think AI, I mean, I know AI is not a threat to creativity. I'm absolutely sure of it. And so I just tell people when they ask me, but I don't really fight about it because I don't think like, you know, it, it's natural for people to have fear and loathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the intellectual part of the creative process versus the, let's call it the mechanical side of it. Um, which one of these do you believe is like more important? How do you get them working together? How do you use AI? Well, AI is really, I mean, much like hip hop. I mean, I think hip hop's a very interesting example because mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it really took leaps forward by a combination of, you know, technical, like technical skill and like ability to manipulate technology in new ways. Like if you look at all of the early, greats of hip hop, they all had a technological innovation that they brought to the table, um, mm -hmm. as well as an enormous archive of music. Like they just had an enormous understanding of how music worked from a critical framework. Like they knew, like if you went and asked Tribe Called Quest, like who was on X album in 1973, they would know everyone, right? Like, and similarly, like to me, the creative process that AI demands is, um, you know, it, there's the intellectual part is the tech, understanding the technology, um, which is actually quite hard. And a lot of AI artists don't really understand it, I think, at all well. Um, then you have a 
different thing, which is having access to the whole history of literature. And I, one of the things that I find very interesting about using AI is that you actually need to have a pretty ferocious grasp of basic grammar, which you know we have not really taught in our educational system for a long time. But you know you need to know how grammatical structures work um, in order to manipulate this technology appropriately. And you also need to have a kind of, you know, I have a PhD in Shakespeare, so I have I have a um, I would say a, a basic grounding in English style. But it, that part of my life, the PhD stuff, like the the understanding of the sweep of style over time, that's what I had to access to make this work, right? Rather than any kind of like, you know, just, I have a story to tell, right? Like you really need a pretty systematic understanding of the modes that you're taking from, right? I mean, yes. so the same thing, I've seen some visual artists say the same thing when they use AI, like negligible Brazilian architects of the 1940s they need to know who those people are and what their design sensibility was in order to make this in, in order to make prompts that are actually valid and and, and actually useful right and so I, I mean i think it's actually interesting like ai kind of demands a very foundational understanding of style if you're going to if you're going to use it um Agreed. if you're going to use it in a meaningful way right and yeah. that's i i think that's actually kind of exciting Okay, quick action step here. So the key is learning how to prompt better. You start out prompting by just asking questions and talking to AI like it's a helper, but you quickly realize that getting better at prompting is a huge accelerator and game changer for your own success in life. So these prompts will not only help you get a lot more done faster and accelerate your success, but they'll also help you really get prompting and get better at it. You can get all of these as a gift from me just by going to metamind.co forward slash gift. That's metamind.co forward slash gift. And I'll put that link below and then just opt in to get it. I've also created a powerful video for you called AI in the future of business and work and success that demonstrates some of the key mindsets and prompting strategies to help you get up to speed and get a lot more out of generative AI. And it's also included as a free gift when you register. So just head over to metamind.co forward slash gift to get your AI accelerator prompt pack and the other free goodies. All right, back to our interview. Yes, taste, style, um, kind of um, creative uh, curation, all of this. I, I uh, go ahead. Access to yeah. an archive in your head. That's, I mean, that like, yes. like it is well the, to me, it's the art of the ar archive. Like you need access to a huge amount of, un like you need to know who Thomas Brown is, right? And you need to know who Richard Burton, like Robert Burton is. Like you, you need that stuff in order to make things. Yeah. I'm sorry, my, I didn't my, mean to interrupt. No, no. It, it, yeah, exactly. My, you know, my reference is visual art. And if you're prompting to make visual art, you're, I mean, in a way, creative creativity is combinatorially reintegrating things that have already happened. And then maybe once in a while you stumble across something new as well. And you're remixing all of these things. Hip hop is great. Or the, the DJ, I think is a great example. And the more, you know, the movements, the styles, the individuals, the terms, the vocabulary, once the more you have that, the more you can remix until you, you find something that is interesting rather than, yeah, exactly. So same page here. And so, well, how do you do this? What, what, how do you, yeah, how do you get yourself? Well, each time right? I've done it differently, right? Like each time yeah. I've done it differently. So like sometimes I have built like, let's take the entire corpus of Charles Dickens and put it into a machine, have it process it overnight and then have, and then say at the end, right, you know, a description of a market, a boy walking through a market from the point of view of Charles Dickens. And then it would just give you a perfectly Dickensian sentence of it. That was mm. early days. That was, Chat, that, that was Chat GPT. That was GPT-3 and some earlier models. I mean, obviously, with the stochastic writing of instruments, with pseudo ray, with the archives that I'm, I'm bit, like with the more, the more sort of like you build the archive as well as the prompt, that's all, obviously has a very different functionality and so on. But Every time, I mean, there's two things. You have to really know what you want, and you also have to recognize what works. I mean, because that's the other thing about hip hop, right? Is like they did all this technical stuff, and they had and they had this huge archive. But then, the the key is to get to something that people respond to, 
right? Yes, and then when exactly. they find that thing that people respond to, whatever it, whatever it took to get them there, they don't really they forget about. It. They just yeah, get to yeah, that yeah, thing. Yeah. And that I think also should be a lesson to creative AI people. Like, you know, we we need to get to what what this is, right? And what and what what is what is going to make people respond. And I don't think anyone knows what that is yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have this quote: "Creative AI is going to change everything. It's also going to change nothing." What does that mean? Well, I think it's just another tool, right? Like, I think it's like the camera, and like you know, the, like like it, or. You know, I mean, when I was um, a kid, like I remember when desktop publishing really started and people were like, oh, there's not going to be book designers anymore, right? Like there's not like, because anyone can do it from the comfort of their own home. They won't need book designers, right? Like you just take a picture, slap it in the book designer file. But th what happened is we really realized like, oh, if I have access to the same technology as a designer, I will not, I will not produce a good cover, right? Like you actually need highly skilled people to manipulate this technology, to make something uh, of value. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's the old story. It's not, it's not brain surgery. Like the machines are not going to replace people, but people with the machines are going to replace people without the machines. I mean, it's not like it's, this is not a technology that like people think about like automating newspaper writing. I mean, I doubt it because you're going to have to check it anyway. Right. Like you're going to have to have someone go over it anyway. I mean, it may be mm -hmm. used in some ways, but like there's going to be a human at the beginning and a human at the ending in, in, in virtually every iteration of this that I can think of. Right. Mm -hmm. And 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 so, you know, I'm not worried at all about jobs in the creative economy or any. I mean, there's the worry about jobs in the creative economy. I mean, we should all be worried, but not for this. Like there's a lot of other reasons to worry, um, but, For example, but I don't think AI what, what, is going to replace anything. What's the distinction there? What should we worry about in jobs in the creative economy? Oh, the uh, total erosion of uh, media from from social media and like the destruction of uh, of the news ecosystem, which is you know catastrophic on any number of levels. But also like the fact that musicians, you know, are really like musicians are are in real trouble. Right. Like, we, you know, I, I and for all sorts of reasons, but mainly because like the streaming systems don't pay them. Um, mm -hmm. But like, you know, I mean, we're in a we're in a we're in a changing environment here where a lot of things are very poor for artists for, you know, really genuinely any content creator of any kind. Right. And but I don't think A.I. is anywhere near the threat as these other as these other forces. Mm hmm. Yeah, and uh, because you can learn so quickly right now with the internet, and because there's more and more, let's just call them evolutionary selection pressures, you've got other people and groups that are learning and integrating different knowledge very quickly. You have to kind of be an artist, but you also have to be an entrepreneur, and you also have to you know, be able to communicate, and you need several skills in a way to make it these days. Well, every artist I know has is coming up with business plans all the time. It's horrible. I mean, that's not what this is supposed to be at all. But I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, the, the other thing with AI that is actually kind of interesting to me is that, um, you know, I think the really interesting AI that's going to be built is going to actually be relatively capital intensive. Like, I think it's going to be like film, where it's going to require technical people who can connect technical people with creative people with basic production. And also... A, a vision of an audience, right? And those institutions absolutely do not exist right now, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, there are some hints here or there. There are like little little places, but like, you know, if you have if, if you have an AI project that you need to get, and and they do require money to to make, mm -hmm. um, it, I, where to go to find those resources and where to build those things is actually, uh, it, it's not there. I mean, that's the thing that I actually find very interesting. Like everyone's like, AI is, AI is the future, AI is this, but like, it's like, well, who's actually, the, the, the AI companies are building better and better AI, but the actual applications of it creatively and so on, I mean, I just don't, I just don't see that being built by, by anyone, not anyone that I, hmm. I, that I've been able to get into contact with anyway. So if you were, um, or maybe we can, you know, speak to uh, all the artists and the musicians and the writers out there. 
if you were someone who you were creative, you, you had talent, you care, you've been trying, you're actually making art and you know, you've got the shit scared out of you right now. And you're saying, okay, I, but I see how this maybe could, you know, be a path forward. Cause I'm watching some of my artist friends who are starting to use it to, you know, be creative. What would you tell them? What would, you know, could you give us a little action plan for them? Should they go learn a particular tool? How should they think about this? How should they, you know, kind of engage with it to find the next step in their career? Well, I, I mean, I guess the, the thing would be, I would fool around with a bunch of different systems, like even older systems. I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is happening now. There's Gemini. There's open, there's going to be a lot of different systems, and these open large language models that are coming out are very exciting. And like mm -hmm. I, fooling around with them, like go and fool around with them. But I think it's also really important to remember, like I'm someone who writes, you know, I write features for magazines and I write essays, and um, this is this is sort of like um, avant-garde cooking. Right. These are this is like sous vide cooking or something like that. Like it's these are a bunch of techniques that are potentially very interesting and potentially can give you different effects and a very. But, you know, you're never going to not need how to do basic things like you're, you're never like you're you're don't think that this is going to replace you know, the need to know how meter works and how rhyme works and how an opening nut graph should work and how a second nut graph works and how basic structures of argument in a column work and how the Rondo structure of an essay returns. Like these structural concerns, like the, the, the really crude um, narrative things that like you learn in grade school or you learn in junior high, and those things actually are gonna matter more. And mm -hmm. there's no, like, I think there are lots of uses, lots of literary uses for which AI will simply never be used. Like, I, I, I like, I, I and um, this, these are very, just similarly to like the camera. Like there are certain things that emerge from the camera that were extremely exciting aesthetically, but painting continued just as it, you know, it still, it still had um, a huge creative flourishing under the era of the camera. So, it's one tool among many. Do not do not believe the apocalyptic rhetoric. Like it, it, it is. I, I mean, I would I would say like, don't be a, don't be afraid. Like it's 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 as scary as the camera, right? Which is like maybe you want to use it, maybe you don't. Maybe you want to integrate it in some weird way, maybe you don't. Um, I, I I think it's. I mean, I'm obsessed with it. I love using it. I'm I'm in love with this technology. Like I. I wake there are so many exciting applications that no one has ever like I wrote an infinite short story with this thing like it's it, it, it's it's inherently just so so fascinating but um that's how it should be treated as a subject for fascination not as something to be afraid of hmm. oh, beautiful do you think that it wakes up at some point it becomes sentient it has will no I, I mean I'm a pretty hard skeptic of um uh, HGI. I mean, you know, like to to me, from my experience using it, um, and from you know, like for for example, like we just don't have a meaningful definition of consciousness. Like when you go and talk to neuroscientists about like, can you define consciousness for me? Like I interviewed one guy who said, Stephen, we can't define sensation. Like we don't have a falsifiable theory of the color red or or the sound of a violin like we're not we're not in the we're not in the ballpark of having a falsifiable thesis of consciousness so if you don't have a falsifiable thesis of consciousness you're not in science anymore you're in a metaphor and you're in analogies and you're in very humanistic vague feelings um i would say that you know the kind of intelligence that you feel from an artificial intelligence is the the whole point of it to me the whole beauty of it um is that it's not human at all you know it does not work the human brain does not work by matrix multiplication and backward propagation like we know that it works on forward propagation and uh, and it does not work by matrix multiplication so when you're when you're dealing with this i think to me what we're encountering you know we're so arrogant as a species that we think that intelligence is going to be like us and that we, and that it's going to and it, it, what what this is is something similar to like the way sperm whales talk to each other. You know, they have they have brains that are six times the size of us. They have lengthy 
decade long conversations off the coast of Dominica. They, we know they have names for each other. We just don't really understand them. And there's this going to be this permanent chasm between us and, you know, AI between what that, what it means and what we mean. Um, mm-hmm. But it, but it, yeah, the, I, you know, I would just say that ideas of artificial general intelligence or the singular, I mean, those are religious concepts that have been essentially imported into the technological space. And I don't, I don't see any evidence of them at all. Like, I, I, I like, I don't, I don't see any, um, I, I, I would, you know, I, it's not exactly like I'm an optimistic guy either. I mean, my last book was called the next civil war. And then I wrote a book called the last election with Andrew Yang. Like I'm not the world's most hopeful person, but I just don't mm-hmm. fear it at all. Mm-hmm. If you could, uh, leave us all with one piece of wisdom or advice to go forward into the next, you know, five to 10 years as this, you know, explodes in terms of its power and capabilities, what would it be? We're at the beginning of something tr- magical. And I mean that in a literal sense. Like, I think, you know, like the, n- the magic of this technology is that it's a power that transcends our understanding, right? Which is mm-hmm. the technical definition of magic. And the, Certain re- human reactions to the unknown and to the and to the mysterious, which AI, you know, the the closer you, when you interview people who were there when the transformer was invented, um, you know, they're full. They don't know what happened, right? Like they they are they are absolutely as engulfed in the mystery as the rest of us with artificial mm-hmm. intelligence, and they and and, the, and that mystery. There are several different responses to it. One is to just want to blow it out of the sky. The other is to try to control it in some kind of like government room. But I don't think that's the creative response. I think the creative response is to try to find in this technology sources of joy and Mm -hmm. sources of beauty. And I think we should absolutely pursue um, joy and beauty through this stuff, um, you know, regardless of what anyone tells us to do with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate you uh, coming today. It's been uh, great talking to you. My pleasure. So thank you for watching another MetaMind AI interview. Remember to keep practicing prompting, keep learning, get our prompt pack and quick start video, watch our other videos to learn from other AI experts, and stay tuned to us here on MetaMind. Stay subscribed because this is going to get really interesting.